Yoni Kala for the introduction. Thank you for coming. So my task this morning is to try to give you an introduction to these objects. And this afternoon, you will have a little bit more details on two aspects of, uh, of those. So what I will not do, for instance, this morning, I will not discuss the historical, uh, physical approach to these objects. This will be done by Denis. And I will not discuss some delicate aspects of uh, conformal invariance related to these parafermionic observables. This will be uh, something that uh, apparently <laughs> Dima is not going to do this afternoon, if I can see his face uh, becoming blank and uh, panicked. Uh, so I will, I will definitely discuss some of uh, the conformal invariance relations to, to these objects, but I will not discuss the easing model or not in much details. Really, my goal this morning, because you could wonder what I'm going to do, uh, my goal this morning is to try to take one example where the definition is fairly simple and go over it. So I will define the model, take the time of defining as a model, then I will define parafermionic observable and give you a few applications of these objects in this special case. So I didn't aim for a broad review or anything like that. I really aimed at some, like, go home, uh, message that you can uh, keep uh, after that. So in this perspective, I will define and take a little bit of time uh, discussing the model that I will uh, uh, study this morning. So it's called the loop ON model. It's a model that was originally introduced in the 80s. Among the authors, I think the one who then studied it the most was Ninhaus. And his name is going to come in the mix several times. So the model is simple. You take the hexagonal lattice. You cut a piece, a finite piece of it. So you take omega included in the hexagonal lattice, which I will call H. You take omega finite. And the configuration in your model, I'm going to pick at random something. The something is a collection of non-intersecting loops on omega. So eta is a loop configuration. Simply if it's an even subgraph of omega, meaning the degree at every vertex is even. On the hexagonal lattice, it automatically implies that you are just a collection of non-intersecting loops. So it has a loop configuration if it is an even subgraph of omega. So this is the collection of configurations. Now what is the distribution? What is the probability of a configuration? Well, there will be two parameters. So you take x a positive number. And n normally should be larger than minus 2, but to simplify, we, there are a bunch of probabilities here, so I don't want to scare them too much and to scare myself. So I'm going to take n larger or equal to 0. And then simply look at the measure. I'm going to call it mu, depending on omega, x, and n. And the configuration eta has a probability which will be proportional to x to the number of edges in eta and to the number of loops in eta. So this is the number of loops. This is the number of edges. If I just do it like that, it's not a probability measure. So I just renormalize in order to get a probability measure. And this constant here, I call it the I mean, uh, partition function of the model. You will understand why I put this empty set as a superscript in a minute. OK. So here, uh, remember that this is kind of redundant with the definition of a loop configuration. But here, this is a distribution which is really only on loop configuration. OK. So it gives me a random loop configuration on omega. Let me 
maybe before we, we really study this in uh, full generality, let me discuss a few specific examples. So there is one first example, which is not very maybe spectacular like that, is if you put n equals 0. So if you put n equals 0, you can think, OK, then in this case, the only configuration that you are looking at is the empty configuration. Not very interesting as it is. Except that here, you can easily imagine that I restricted myself to even subgraph, but I could also look, say, at even subgraph with just two sources, like two places where I have an odd degree. So imagine this was my measure with empty set of sources. I could just say, OK, let's put two sources. So there are two vertices, A and B, that have odd degree now. Okay? If I do that, I can exactly look at the same thing. Here, I will have a renormalization which is different because there is just different set of configurations. But in this case, n equals 0 makes perfect sense. It just means I will have no loops in my configuration. That just means I have a path, self-avoiding, going from A to B. So this. Oh, I mean, yeah, OK, I have in mind uh, the boundary things, but you are right. Uh, you should, uh, well, it depends then how you count loops. But uh, you are right. So let's say degree 1. That would be uh, simple. So n equals 0, this is what we call the self-avoiding walk model. So it's uh, just one random pass going from A to B. There is another case of interest, which is n equal 1. And here it's a little bit more subtle, but because uh, Dima is going to discuss, I hope, this at some point, I will try to, to give a few more details. So here, it's a connection to the easing model. So do the following. So the easing model is a random assignment. of plus or minus 1. And here I'm going to assign them to the faces of my hexagonal lattice. So to the triangular lattice. To faces of omega. And the probability of a configuration will depend on two parameters, uh, will depend on one parameter, t, or let's call it beta. So the, assi the assignment is going to be called sigma. The probability of a spin configuration will be proportional to exponential of minus beta edge of sigma divided by a renormalization constant, where edge of sigma is equal to minus sum of sigma x sigma y for x neighboring y. OK, so well, let's call it another pair. So x, y, an edge of the dual of omega. So you have a dual graph. And you are summing on pairs like that of neighboring faces. OK? So this is a classical uh, model. I think most of you already heard about it. And you will hear more about it this afternoon. So probably I'm not going to discuss uh, this model in details. The only thing I want to say is the following. If I give you a spin configuration on the faces, and if I start drawing all the edges between faces with different spins, Let's say I do something like that, and then pluses and so on. And I draw all the faces, all the edges between faces with different spins. 
So let's say this is one example. What I obtain automatically is a loop configuration. So it's uh, exactly an object of this type. And well, when I look at this expression, exponential of minus beta times edge of sigma, I can rewrite it very simply in terms of this loop configuration. So there is a bijection. Let's say it's not completely a bijection. It's a two to one map between sigma and uh, eta. But the important thing is that exponential of minus beta edge of sigma, I can rewrite it in terms of eta of sigma for the simple reason that an edge which is not in eta is between two faces with the same spin. Hence, contribute here an exponential of minus beta, while every face which is between two different spins contributes, there is a sigma x sigma y, which will be uh, e to beta before, sorry, e to the minus beta with this one. So every face there contributes e to the beta. Uh, every edge which is not there contributes e to the uh, minus beta. Every edge here contributes e to the beta. So I get e to the minus beta times the number of edges in omega, which uh, yeah, e of omega, which is a constant, times e to the 2 beta, and I made something wrong, sorry, it's something like that, e to the minus 2 beta times the number of edges in omega of sig in uh, eta of sigma. So this can be re-expressed like that. This is a constant. So when I plug that there, I can really in the same way express the probability of eta as simply e to the minus 2 beta to the eta of sigma divided by a constant, which is now not quite the same constant, simply because I had to multiply by this. But it's a constant. So what did I do here? I basically rewrote this thing in terms of this one, in terms of this model. So I cheated a little bit. It's Monday morning, we are allowed. Why did I cheat it? Because it's not a one-to-one -one map, right? The reason is that if I give you eta of sigma, once I give you the spin of one of the, of the faces, then I can reconstruct all the others. But before that, I have two choices, just there is a plus minus symmetry. So in fact, here, what I really want to do is to fix the spin somewhere. So in, for instance, you can decide to fix the spins outside of your graph. So you just decide that all the faces outside of your graph receive spin plus, and then it's a one-to-one -one map. So here, the true statement was in fact that I want to look at what we call the plus measure for the spin, uh, for the easing model. So here you will have well, let's write it like that, but this time we, or, or let's, yeah, let's keep it like that, sorry. But let's add minus sum of sigma x for x on the boundary of my graph. So they all interact with one spin outside, which is plus, okay? And when you do that, and you write this thing, you exactly end up here on mu omega, x will be equal to e to the minus 2 beta, n is equal to 1. There is no n to the number of loops in this picture, so it's n equal 1 of eta of sigma. So there is really, it's an equivalent way of writing the easing model with plus boundary conditions. So n equal 1 x equal to e to the minus 2 beta this is just the easing model plus boundary condition on the triangular lattice at inverse temperature 
beta. So a fundamental example. And this really, I think, that uh, Dima is going to tell you much more about that. Mo probably not on the hexagonal lattice, but it will be the same. In particular, there is one special case which is, will be of interest for us in these lectures. What is uh, beta equals zero is ink model. Okay, so it's an assignment of plus and minus ones. But there is no interaction, because beta is equal to zero, there is no interaction between the faces. So it's just coloring at random the faces of my triangular lattice in plus or minuses. So it's called Bernoulli percolation in this case. So n equal 1, beta equals 0, meaning x equal 1. Well, it's equivalent to Bernoulli percolation of parameter. Well, I will color in pluses with probability one half, color in minuses with probability one half. So it's with parameter p equal one half, which is the critical point for this model. <coughs> so keep in mind these three examples, n equals zero, n equal one, general x is the easing model, n equal 1, x equal 1 is just Bernoulli percolation. So what is Bernoulli percolation again? So Bernoulli percolation, sorry, I should be more, uh, more specific. So Bernoulli percolation on a graph, and here it's going to be site Bernoulli percolation, actually, yeah, yeah, site Bernoulli percolation, is just you color every face black or white, or if you prefer, plus or minus. Completely independently, for each face, you toss a coin, you color it black or white. It gives you a coloring, a random coloring of your graph. And then what you are usually interested in there is the connectivity properties of this uh, random coloring. I will come back to that maybe. Uh, I will tell you more about this special case anyway. So it, you color, well, maybe uh, you color faces black or white, so this is plus, this is minus, Uni I mean, at random, and uh, the probability of coloring black is probability p, and probability of coloring white is 1 minus p, so here it's p equal 1 half uh, Bernoulli percolation. I will come back to that and tell you more. Uh, I plan to do something about this model. Okay. So pick your favorite example, keep it in mind for what comes next. So before I tell you about paraphernalic observable, it's maybe a good point to tell you what, I mean, I mean to think of together about what are the good questions on this model. So first thing, what you really want to do is to take omega larger and larger. It's something which is not straightforward to do, actually. But let's even imagine you can take omega up to the whole lattice. So you make omega go to infinity in some sense. So the definitions themselves don't really make sense because you need to be in finite volume to be able to count the number of edges and the number of loops. But as I I'm guessing, I will not surprise anybody that you can make just a limiting procedure and take the weak limit of measures in finite volume to define something in infinite volume. This is something that people are very used to in statistical physics. Actually, for the loop or end model, it's a very difficult task because there is no monotonicity properties except in special cases. But let's ignore that. You can always, anyway, extract subsequential limits because the space of measure is tight. So you could define measures in infinite volume. In volume limit. And you can study as soon as you have an infinite volume measure 
you want to study a family of infinite volume measures, you want to study whether they are undergoing a phase transition or not. So here, what, does, uh, what would it mean? So phase transition, you have different types of phase transition. The most classical one is a phase transition between an ordered and a disordered phase. So here, maybe the equivalent would be to think maybe there is a range of parameters where the loops are all small. And, well, small in the sense, for instance, that the biggest one I will encounter, I mean, they are never like bounded size uniformly in the lattice, so maybe the biggest claim you can hope is that you will, they will grow log the biggest one you will see at distance n will be logarithmic. So that will correspond, so it will be corresponding to an exponential decay phase where basically the probability, so this is the definition, mu of h x n of say the loop of uh, vertex a has length larger or equal to k is decaying exponentially fast in k. So in this phase, because there are polynomial number of vertices at distance n, the biggest one I will see, the biggest loop I will see, will typically be logarithmic. So that is one possible behavior of this infinite volume uh, measures. Another possible behavior will be that there will be an ordered phase. In the sense, there will be, for instance, an infinite loop crossing the lattice. This, in fact, will never occur. You really have to think that we are in a uh, costalist tau-less type phase transition for the physicist in the room. You will never have an ordered phase. So what is the alternative behavior? So for people, for probabilists, who are used, for instance, to percolation, you have this disordered phase where all the clusters are finite and have exponential tails. You have this phase where you have an infinite cluster of pluses. So there are only two phases. Well, not really. There is one phase exactly at the critical point where the behavior of the clusters is, is polynomial. You have polynomially big, I mean, you have positive probability of having big cluster and the probability that the cluster at the origin is polynomially big, is decaying polynomially. There is only one point with this occur, it's a critical point. Well, here, there will be a whole range of parameters at which the loops will, in fact, decay polynomially. So I will call this the critical phase. These are not standard denominations, but I think since it's an introduction, it will be sufficiently uh, uh, intuitive for, uh, for everybody. So in this phase, the point is that the loop at a vertex A has length larger or equal to K will be larger or equal to 1 over K to some constant C. Totally, I will put a small C here and a big C. OK, so in this phase, you can actually restate the thing in the following. You expect the following. So that's, I mean, this is really the interesting phase. So in this phase, many things happen. And in particular, if I look at a ball of size n around the origin, in this phase, there will be actually macroscopic loops. There will be one loop, which is uh, one or more, of course, but there will be loops which will roughly have the size of the whole box. And in fact, I will not have only one. I will have a family of loops, maybe one which is twice smaller, Something like that. Etc. 
I will have, uh, in fact, a compact, in some sense, a tight family of random loops. So a natural question, if in a box of size n you typically see something like that, a natural question is what happens when I rescale my lattice so that my box exactly fits in a box of size 1 and take a look at the random family of loops that I obtain as a family, as a limit when n tends to infinity. So just rescale. Imagine this is 1, but the hexagons have size 1 over n. Ah, is that, ah well, classical, yes. Uh, and I also added eta. It's uh, because I want to that you are very careful, very attentive to what I'm doing. So let's put delta, and this was one over delta. So now it's one. So you take hexagon of size delta. Let's define mu delta to be the push forward of the measure by this rescaling. So it's just a measure that you will obtain on that. Then you have a random collection of loops. So it's not completely clear what you mean by that because you have more and more loops. But for instance, what you could imagine is to cut only the loops larger than epsilon, say. Epsilon is a threshold. And take the limit. And the question is, what is this limit? So. What is the limit of eta delta, which is sample according to mu delta? So what is the limit of this family of loops, which has low mu delta? And in this regime, in the, so it, by the way, in the other regime here, if you do this limit, and you, for every epsilon, so you fix epsilon, you look at only loops of size larger than epsilon. Well, in this regime, because the biggest one was logarithmic, the biggest one here is logarithm divided by, I mean, multiplied by delta. So it's log of 1 over delta times delta. So it will just collapse. All the loops will collapse to points. They will never have size larger than epsilon. So it's empty, an empty configuration here in this regime. In this one, because you have positive probability of having big loops, you end up with something non-trivial. And this something non-trivial is substantially non-trivial in the sense that physicists expect that in addition it has a lot of symmetries. So here maybe uh, that's a very poor drawing of a box of size n on the hexagonal lattice. So a box of size n in the hexagonal lattice has a shape like that. So what do I mean by a lot of symmetries? So imagine eta delta converge as delta tends to 0 as a random object, so for instance in low, to a collection of loops in the continuum. Let's call it eta like that. Well, this guy, the law of this guy, uh, this guy obviously is invariant by rotation by pi over two, uh, by pi over three, two pi over three. Sorry, right? Simply because the original measure was already invariant under this. But what physicists predict is that in fact this measure has much. I mean, this object has much more symmetries, many many more symmetries. In fact, it's symmetric under any conformal map, meaning that if I take So here I took one box, an hexagonal box. But at the end, you agree with me that I could have taken any shape. And take, a, take the limit of this object. This is the boundary? This is the boundary of my box, yeah. Well, there are conformal maps mapping this to this. And in this new domain, there are two natural objects that you can define if you have a conformal map from this to this. Let's call it uh, phi. Here, you can just define eta, so let's call this guy omega. 
eta omega just by taking this limit. Just I take this domain, I take the same limit, so the scaling limit. But I could also take the image of the limit I obtain in this domain in this one. I'm cheating a little bit because here there are three parameters that I'm put swiftly under the, the carpet. But I mean, it's not an introduction to conformal theory. It's an introduction to paraphernalic observable. So I want to dive as fast as possible on the, I mean, in the, the heart of the subject. But here, what I claim is that I can just take the limit of these loops there, map it by my conformal map phi. I end up with a family of loops here, just it's the image of loops there. And what I claim is that these two objects, they have the same law. That's what is predicted. So conformal invariance claims that these two objects have the same law. So we will hear, I think, more about this uh, this afternoon. So maybe I don't tell you too much about it. But what I wanted just to emphasize is that in this critical regime, there is a very, I mean, rich class of possible behavior for the models, for these loops, and there is a very rich scaling limit. Okay? And the natural question is, how can we understand this? Can we get a grasp at this? Which are, for instance, the parameters for which I have this behavior? For which parameters do I have this behavior? If I am in this behavior, can I prove, for instance, conformal invariance? That's a big program, right? Don't worry, the answer is no in most cases. So I'm not going to prove conformal invariance. Well, I will prove conformal invariance of something today. But um, you cannot do it in full generality. OK, so at least now you understand where we want to aim. Or at least I, I, I believe you understand where, <laughs> where we want to aim. OK, so in order to do that, we are going to introduce an object. It's going to look maybe a little bit mysterious. But I want to leave some. Uh, yes, yes, of course. Yes. <coughs> Is there some implicit claim <coughs> that there is a unique choice of x and n for which you have this uh, this phase? This conformal map. Uh, so this phase. So I will come to that. Yes, I will exactly come to that. So, well, let me come to that at the time where. But it's indeed a very natural question. For which parameters do you expect? to have this phase. And in fact, I will come to the fact that there, is, there are many ways of being conformally invariant, and even just identifying which way is already a challenge. But it shouldn't particularly be independent of, of, the, of the... It will not be independent of x and n. Not independent of omega. I mean. uh, it will be independent of omega, yes. Yes. For, for, a certain parameter, for certain parameters of x and n, it will be conformal invariant, meaning for any omega, if I take two, I mean, uh, for any omega and for any conformal map from omega to another domain omega prime, you will have that eta omega and the, I mean, eta omega prime and the image of eta omega by the conformal map are the same law. You mean when you say the same law, do you, do you view these two configurations as configurations in full uh, plane or? No, really in the yeah. domain, right? So if you cut here, if you only look at the loops in this, and you take uh, the image, you obtain that. So I mean, here I was a little bit uh, uh, not precise on the fact that I defined this on the full plane. Here, in fact, to really claim this conformal invariance, what you really want to do is to define a measure, which is really here you take loops and only in this domain. So you take really mu omega xn, you take the limit. So by definition, you have no loops that exit the domain because you are really in this domain. There you do the same with this other domain, which I, yeah, so here it's After mu. Rescaling. After rescaling, yes, yes. Yeah, it's really with double bar there. It's really the infinite volume uh, limit. But how can you compare the laws of this? Uh, so then there are just families of loops on the same domain, right? So these are the, is, 
at, at least the state of, I mean, the space of configuration is the same, right? Here they are different, here they are on this domain, there they are on this other domain, but I really conformally map by uh, phi, right? So then it's a family of loops on this domain for both. Sorry? They are not the same, because this is a nicely symmetric thing, over there it won't be. So uh, they are random objects, right? So I only claim that they have the same law. And indeed, here, for a given configuration, I really do not hesitate to ask questions. For a given configuration, it's not symmetric, right? It's just the law of the object is symmetric. The law of getting that... The yeah. hexagonal graph is symmetric, but the yes. hexagonal, if I just intersect this domain exactly. with the usual hexagonal graph, I will get something that looks very different, even combinatorially. Exactly. Yeah. Yes, that is true, and that's where physicists are better than mathematicians. <laughs> because the mathematician would be scared by that, I think, rightfully, but physicists are not. So the point is that there, indeed, the lattice is not at all symmetric by any thing, right? The lattice is really this one. But you take the limit first, so you kind of forget in some sense the lattice, and what the physicists are telling you is that you really forget, for instance, the orientation of the lattice you started with. But this is something beautiful and miraculous in some sense. Right? It's not miraculous, but <laughs> surprising at least the first time you see. So here, the symmetry by 2 pi over 3 is really obvious from the model. There, for instance, even just the symmetry by 2 pi over 3 is not at all obvious. I'm sorry. Yes. Macroscopically, <coughs> macroscopically, how can you compare the laws of the configurations here and there because they don't live in the same no, macroscopic no, domain. They do, because you conformally map here. These are loops on, the on this domain, but you conformally map by phi. Phi is a map from this domain to this one. So then any loop which is there is a loop here. Okay. Yes. But, but phi of this lattice is not that lattice. Sorry? Yes, but this is not important because here it's the infinite. If you want, it's really here, like let's call it it's zero plus, okay? It's really the limit when delta tends to zero. So in the limit, there is no reason you don't gain additional uh, symmetries. Just think simple random walk on the square lattice, okay? You move your, your random walk on the lattice really feels that there are four cardinal directions, right? You take the limit of these objects, you end up with Brownian motion, which is completely rotationally symmetric. So you gain symmetry in the limit. That's the whole beauty of the whole theory. Here, it's exactly the same that happens. Well, you have macroscopic symmetries, but not microscopic symmetries. Yes. Yes. Concerning mm -hmm. um, invariance, can you prove that if you assume uh, invariance on the dilatation and rotation, can you prove them? No, it's not. It's not obvious, at least at the level of the lat. I mean, uh, at I mean, with our theories, it's absolutely not uh, clear how you end up with this additional uh, symmetry. So already the rotate. Yeah, even assuming it's uh, and this is a question I like because I think there are ways, for instance, for the random cluster model to kind of sense that for any of these models you have rotational symmetry, but I have absolutely no clue how you would deduce from that and scale invariance. Um, uh, yeah, that's. Uh, Sorry? You should add locality. Exactly. You, you should add locality, which is uh, really not so... Uh, In physics, there is a folklore that is uh, no, no, no. locality. Yes, no. yes, that is true, but... Uh, <laughs> okay. So, in order to try to understand that, let's try to introduce a model and a, a, a tool, which will look a little bit mysterious this morning, but we will have the deep roots of this, uh, this uh, object this afternoon. We will have some uh, perspective on it. So I will kind of keep the mystery and just define the object and work with it. So these objects are called paraphernunic observables. OK. So. So really, if you are a little bit confused or if you're not convinced by the conformal invariant speech, just think of the questions, do I am in this phase or in this other phase? That's already a sufficiently hard question for us anyway. Okay, so the idea is the following. 
you are still expecting conformal invariance, so you are expecting that your loops have a lot of symmetries, and these symmetries are related to, so, I mean, to conformal maps. So the game is going to be that if you have that, then you expect that certain just observables, certain random variables, expectation of random variables, have the same symmetries. Okay. And then the next step is to think, okay, if you have this, can I find, like, can, I've, can I guess which observables they are? And if they have symmetries, conformal symmetries, they are probably conformal maps. So can I actually guess in the discrete model, which is on a lattice where indeed there are cardinal, uh, cardinal directions, directions that are preferred by the lattice, can I find objects that already are, in some sense, the finite volume <laughs> versions of these very symmetric observables. Okay. And the right object will be the following. So the first guess would be, well, I want a function that, they point of a, uh, that depends on a point. So what I could try to do is to introduce a singularity, introduce a place where I have an odd degree in my model, instead of even. Okay, so I could try to, to put, so this is now omega. It's really in finite volume. Forget all this taking the scaling limit. We will work in finite volume. So take this domain omega and take a point inside, which I would call z, and I want z to be, I will evaluate certain thing at z, and this will be, a f I will see it as a function of z. So I want, that at z, for instance, I have odd degrees. So there will be a path starting from z and loops. So because, because I need necessarily to have an even number of sources, I need another source. So I could try to put another source inside. Yeah, I just finished that and then, then uh, I'm yours. So you could pick, put another source inside. What I will do to simplify a little bit the matter, I will put my source on the boundary. Okay, so we'll put another source here on the boundary. I will call it A. Okay, a you have a question. Exactly, yeah, yeah. I mean, so I answer and then I go back to you. It, it, it's not at all obvious why the hexagonal lattice plays a special part. Yeah, I will come to that. I will, I will really come to and that. The second question, will you ever actually tell us what we now know about these uh, Nienhuis ON models? We will, uh, I will also come to that. Good. Yes, yes, uh, yes, yes. That's, uh, <laughs> excellent. That's, uh, we are on the same uh, <laughs> vibe. Yes? No? Okay. So, so my goal is to have pictures of this type. So first, I want to be a little bit precise on what I'm going to do, is Z and A will be middle of edges. So you have an edge here, and Z is the middle of an edge. You will understand why it will become important later. And same thing for A on the boundary. So what I will do is that the boundary, if you think about it, looks like that, right? It looks like that. Yes, it's a terrible choice, okay. <laughs> it doesn't look like that, but I think schematically it does. Uh, oh, that's a, well, I would never learn how to draw this thing. So actually what I mean a boundary vertex is I really took a half edge exiting my lattice like that, and I pick, so say this is A, and I have a pass like that going from A. So this is now my space of configuration. A is fixed. Z, think of it as a point which is like the variable in the function I will define. Okay. So the most natural function you could try to define in this case is the following. So you could try to define G of A, I mean G of Z, which would be a function of omega x n A and z, but I will only see it as a function of z, defined as a sum over every uh, eta in 
the space, this will be the space of even subgraph of omega, plus the fact that A and Z have odd degree. OK? So it's a space of loop configuration with a path from A to Z. I could put x to the eta, n to the loop of eta. And I could, re I could renormalize. So I actually have several ways of renormalizing. I will renormalize by this quantity. You will understand why later. You, you want a degree or degree one as before? So here, so now that you are mid edges, mm -hmm. there is no question about, and that's exactly why I got, <laughs> I, I, I got confused before. Because you are mid edges, you cannot have degree three. So really here, it's in fact degree one. Yes, you are entirely right. OK, so here there is some kind of, uh, of non-equivocal uh, definition of, of degree one or order or even. So this will be kind of the green function, if you think a little bit, of these walks from A to Z living in a family of loops, in some sense, that he needs to avoid. So this is a very... You have to avoid the loops. Yes, yes. So here, you really, every vertex has degree 2 or 0, except A or Z. So the loop itself cannot come and intersect, I mean, the path itself cannot come and intersect a loop, because otherwise it will make degree 3. So this is a very natural object. In particular, for the easing model, it's related to the spin-spin correlation of the model. The problem is that this function, while you can try to predict the limit of, of this, is really not very easy to study and to, uh, to work with. So what we are going to do, we are going to modify this object a little bit by adding a twist to it. And this, this twist and why you add it and where it comes from, uh, this really, uh, that's your job. Then. <laughs> I like to make everybody panic. I mean, everybody meaning the two other speakers. So uh, yeah. I mean, at least why there is a twist and why it's kind of natural, this normally you should get a little bit from uh, Denis talk. So here, what we are going to do is we are going to define a function. I'm going to put it here because I really want you to see the connection with the other one. It's renormalized by exactly the same thing. But at the top here, it's the same object as well. It's the same weight here. But here, I will add a new thing, which is e to the i sigma, and there is a minus, times w of gamma of omega a z. So what is this thing? Well, sigma. is just a free parameter. We will see how we choose it properly later, but it's really something here that for now I don't want to tell you what is the value. You pick a value sigma. e to the minus i, I think everybody knows what that means. What remains is this term. What does this term mean? So gamma of omega is simply the path from A to Z, OK? Pass from A to Z. This, I think, is now clear. And omega is a full configuration. Sorry? Omega is a full configuration. Uh, oh, sorry, yeah, omega is actually eta, sorry. So it was not clear. <laughs> now, the winding of the walk is just the number of left turns minus number of right turns times pi over 3. It's simply the total rotation of the walk from A to Z. Every time I turn on the left, I add pi over 3, every time I turn on the right, I subtract pi over 3. OK? So in particular, notice that for a given endpoint, well, the winding 
is if I arrive, so if I have my edge like that, and I arrive, say, like that, the winding is defined up to 2 pi, in fact. Right? But it can take several values. If I arrive, say, like that, it takes a certain values. If I arrive like that, it does take a different value, which is 2 pi plus the original value. So it's not deterministic of the point A, of z a and Z. It's a priori defined only up to 2 pi. I mean, it is well defined, but it can take values. Well, it on the box. Yeah, exactly. It can take values on like omega z w0 plus 2 pi z. So this thing looks much worse than before. It m looks more complicated than this quantity, in particular because of this complex twist. This is a complex number. Here we were working with a real function here, real valued function here. It's a complex valued function. Yet, it has actually a very nice property. And that's where we start to dive in the magic of this thing. So lemma. If, so n is between 0 and 2, and there will be two choices. So the first choice is, is sigma is equal to minus, I mean, to 1 minus 3 pi over 4, uh, 3 over 4 pi, sorry, arcos of minus n over 2. So it's a certain value of sigma, OK? and x equal x c of n equal 1 over square root of 2 plus square root of 2 minus n. Or if sigma is equal to minus 1 half minus 3 over 4 pi arcos of minus n over 2 and x equal x c tilde of n, which is the same thing with a minus, If you tune these quantities properly, oops, uh, come here, and here the only difference is that here you get one and here you get minus one half. If you do that, then for every vertex v, what is good is that this is maybe the most important lemma, and I really wrote it the further away from you and in the smallest uh, things possible. So not a failure. So for every vertex like that, you have three mid edges around it, P, Q, and R. And what I claim is that P minus V, F of P, plus Q minus V, F of Q, plus R minus V, F of R, equals zero. So if I choose sigma and x properly, I end up with a local relation. Here it's true for any omega, for any v inside omega. No, no, for every, so for every space omega, for every graph omega, for every vertex in it, I get this local relation. Let me tell you, just interpret for you, okay, at least there is one advantage that it will be allowed to stay here forever, I mean, until the end of my talk, which may sound like forever for some of you, but. <laughs> um, let me interpret this thing. So again, now really there is one value, I mean, there are two values of sigma, two values of x. I mean, one value of x for each sigma, OK? I will give you special examples after. But once I give myself that, I get this local relation for every vertex. How can I interpret this local relation? So I have p, q, and r. Well, imagine for a moment that I ask you to define the discrete integral of the function f on a certain path. Well, when you lo work on graphs, there is a natural thing, which is to define 
the path of integration on the dual lattice. So you take a path on the dual lattice and you want to define the integral along this path, let's call it C, of f of z dz. Well, the natural thing to do if C is a, is a contour, I mean, is a path C0, C1, C2, Cn equals C0, which is really a path of faces, right? It's really on the dual lattice, so it's a polygon, a safe avoiding polygon of the triangular lattice. If I give you that, this integral, I want to define it, it's fairly natural, as the sum for i equals 0 to n minus 1 of ci plus 1 minus ci. So this would be just integrating a constant between ci and ci plus 1 times the value of the function there. So if I have, say, this is ci and this is ci plus 1, what value do I want to give to the function? I want to give, I want to say that the value of the function on this is simply the value at the middle. So here I would define f of ci plus ci plus 1 divided by 2. Do you agree that this is a fairly natural definition of discrete contour? And in particular, if you have a family of functions converging in the scaling limit, when you take smaller and smaller delta to a certain function, then the function will satisfy that the contour integral of this function are zero. Right? This is really a discrete version of that. Okay, how can I reinterpret this orange thing? Well, if you think about it, when I look at the integral along this triangular contour, I would have this minus this times the value here, plus this minus this times the value here, plus this minus this times the value here. Well, this is just a rotation and maybe a multiplication by uh, uh, two or something like that of this relation. So this relation is exactly saying the contour integral of this function f on this small triangle is zero. Okay? So interpretation. Uh, that the integral along this contour of f of z dz is equal to zero. But now I didn't tell you much about what was omega. Imagine now that I take omega to be simply connected in the sense that it doesn't have holes in it. Right? So the complement of omega is connected. So if I take omega is simply connected, of course, in the, in the continuum, I mean, in the discrete, simply connected doesn't really make sense, but really imagine, for instance, I mean, that would be si sufficient, just take that the union of the faces is simply connected. In fact, in general, you need to do something a little bit more complicated, but let's not uh, bother with that. So take omega simply connected. In this case, there are no holes in omega. That means that any contour can be written really in terms of, I mean, in the space, in the vector space, the two vector space of contour inside, in, in inside my omega. Any contour can be written as a sum of the contour of the triangles inside it. But if the discrete contour integral on triangles is zero, then that implies immediately that it's zero for any contour. And that is a discrete version of Morera theorem, right? If you have a continuous function having contour integrals that are zero for every contour, it's holomorphic. Here, you have a discrete version of it, okay? I don't know whether I will have uh, time to tell you about uh, the square lattice and uh, the fact that you can also define things there. There, the interpretation is a little bit different it's more like the, the fact that a certain form is closed. But here on the triangular lattice, we are lucky enough that really means it's really a discrete version of, of Morera theorem. So in some sense, this observable, which, okay, by the way, are called parafermionic observables, these parafermionic observables are discrete holomorphic in some sense. Okay. 
So just, I mean, for if you have to remember one value, I mean, two values, okay, one value, let's say. One value of sigma is n equal one. For n equal one, what are the possible sigma? So you have first the sigma of the first case. In this case, if you just compute, you get sigma equal one half. So for n equal one, first case, sigma is equal to one half and x is equal to one over square root three. Okay. So for people who love the easing model, and that should be all of you, uh, here they will recognize that one over square root three is actually e to the minus two beta c for the easing model on the triangular lattice. So this seems to correspond to the critical point of the associated easing model. So it corresponds to critical point of the easing model on triangular. Meaning that beta c is equal to one half of log of square root three in this case. So e to the minus two beta is equal to one over square root three. Okay, good. Second thing, well there is, there is a second case for the n equal one, which is the second sigma there. And the second sigma is in fact either one or zero, let's say zero. <laughs> but the important thing is that, what did I do? Yes, the x associated to it is one. And that is, correspond to the critical point of percolation. Beta exactly, beta equals zero, exactly. So it's Bernoulli percolation. So at least for n equal one, the two special values correspond to two very classical models at their critical points. This is a very strong hint that this property has a connection to criticality of our models. And in fact, it's not an isolated case. And that's a beautiful prediction of Ninhaus. He did it in a slightly different way. I plan to tell you about maybe in a few sentences about it, but in the remaining time, in the conclusion. So I will skip over it, but so let's so say. N is integral or partial? Can be both N is whatever we want, right? I mean, not integral. Yeah, not, not integral a priori. So Ninhaus conjectured by different means, but not unrelated ones, it's connected, that in fact, well, the first parameter, the first line, the x in the first line, is actually a critical parameter. Critical in the sense, we said that we had two behavior, right? Either exponential or critical phase, where this parameter is the first parameter x for which you have critical behavior. So you are like that. There is xc of n. Here you are in the exponential phase, like exponential decay of the loops. Here you are in the critical phase. And in fact, here as well, including this one, but I will tell you more about it. OK? And this is really conjecture for n smaller or equal to two, which is indeed something that happened, I mean, that occurs in this lemma, okay? So here we are facing something interesting. We have a lemma, which I will prove in a second. You are gonna see it's not a complicated thing to prove, which tells you that a certain function, which I deleted, which that was not a good idea, satisfies some kind of discrete version of holomorphicity. And we have a physics prediction in parallel saying, well, this point is not whatever point, it's the point where there should be a phase transition between exponential phase 
and critical phase. Okay? So it seems to be going very, very well for us because it seems that maybe we have a tool to prove that the critical point is this one. Okay? That's we can be happy. It's uh, Monday morning. So happy on the Monday morning is something rare. And it should remain rare because if you think about it, we are not in such a good place. Why? Because this function, this, these relations, they do not determine at all the function f. There are tons of functions satisfying this thing. It's just a linear system, right, of equations. You have one, e one variable per mid-edge, one equation per vertex. You have only two-thirds of the number of equations you would like. Yes? Yeah, uh, maybe it's related to that. I don't understand. Means when you repeatedly say that it's a discrete version of the holomorphic function, means yes. nothing more theorem. So does it satisfy some Cauchy-Riemann equation of this? Is, this is Cauchy-Riemann. If you want, so that's another way of looking at it. If you want to think of uh, Cauchy-Riemann at this vertex, that's exactly what you would say, right? The discrete derivative in the directions satisfy exactly this linear relation. So the, the linear, linear relation of reminiscent of the Cauchy-Riemann This is Cauchy-Riemann, if you think. The point, I mean, that's another way of seeing, that's actually a good way of seeing what is lacking to get a full, uh, uh, I mean, discrete holomorphic uh, function, is that you are having the discrete holomorphicity, I mean, the Cauchy-Riemann around these vertices. You would lack also the Cauchy-Riemann around these ones, so around the faces. And this, I'm really not telling you how to get, because in general, we won't get that. Well, in a discrete situation like that, differential equation and integral equation are the same. Exactly, yes. Yeah. For, for this, yeah, you are entirely right. No, but he considers on the simply connected faces, means uh, not, uh, the region is defined on for simply connected faces. I don't know for the general case. No, but here, this local relation doesn't require uh, simply connected. It's just the, the integral version of it, which is the uh, fact that all discrete contour integral vanish. This one requires simply connected. So we are really in the, I mean, I think what he said is really coherent with that. Yeah. OK. Um, so just, yeah, I mean, let's be careful not uh, to be too happy too quickly is that there is still lack of information. OK, so what I plan to do now is I plan to prove to you this lemma and then to give you a few applications of this property. Tell you that still we can do things with it. So you see, I'm really not aiming at something general. I'm not going to discuss too much conformal invariance and so on, but I want you to have this kind of small application, which I think are cool. Yes? Okay, you see, lack of information, you see that if you know f, the function f in some cluster, it's not enough to... Exactly, yes, yes. For instance, there is one value of f that you know very well, in fact. It's a. f at a, I mean, there is only one walk from a to a. It's the empty walk. So we are just counting loops configuration divided by loop configuration, you get one. f of a is equal to one. OK, so you would think, OK, maybe with this, this linear system, I could derive all the function. And this is not true because just you count the number of equations. It's linear, so you count the number of equations, count the number of unknown. You are way off. Yes? But this piece of information is still sufficient to prove that any subsequential limit of f will be holomorphic? No. 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 Yes, you can. Uh, it's a linear system, so really, like, I mean, the solutions, like the solution of the systems. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. So I don't think this is something I tried in my uh, PhD. So that's, uh, that's a long time ago, uh, sufficiently long that maybe I was really very wrong at the time. But I do think that you can really take any, uh, uh, I mean, that, that the guys in the kernel are not converging uniformly to zero. Uh, no, but if we assume that there is a subsequential limit, then that's a question of other conditions, right? That's what you're yeah. asking. Yeah. 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 So if, if there is something continuous in the limit, then Morera theorem will. Ah, yes, this, this is true. Yeah, yes, that's but true. But you cannot prove that. That's, uh, sorry, so that is true. But uh, it's a question of whether it's regular enough on the boundary, maybe. But yes, you are right. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yes. Yeah. If you assume this, yes. Yes, sorry. OK, so let me prove this lemma and then give you a few cool uh, applications of it. 
Uh, I will do the first case, but you will see how the second case emerges fairly naturally. Or well, actually, maybe it's... Uh, so, you want to prove that P minus V F of P plus Q minus V F of Q plus R minus V F of R is equal to zero. So this whole thing is what? It's a sum for any loop configuration gamma with one pass from A to P, Q, or R, okay, of a certain contribution. This contribution is, I will call it C of eta. C of eta is x to the number of edges in eta, n to the number of loops in eta, e to the minus i sigma winding of gamma eta from a to z, times, well, the endpoint minus v, right? So I will call it e of omega minus v. This is the endpoint of gamma. So I want to prove that this sum of all these contributions on all the walks, I mean, all the configuration ending at p, q, or r is equal to zero. That looks bad, but maybe you are very, very, very lucky. And that's actually what happens, but I mean, luck is never coming from true luck. So this, we will see this afternoon why it's not, when, why there is a deep reason behind it. But at the level of our introduction to paraphernalic observable, we can still believe in luck and think, okay, maybe the contribution, they already cancel each other just by small groups. I can group my walks in very small groups and the sum of contribution is equal to zero for these groups. Right? So for instance, I can look at walks ending like that. This is, uh, say, P, for instance. And here, there is no loop passing through me, through this vertex. Okay? Uh, actually, let me, no, let me start with there is a loop, sorry. Okay, there is a loop passing like that. This one I can group with two other configurations. So this is omega 1. I can group it with omega 2 and omega 3. Uh, eta 1, sorry. Eta 2, eta 3. Which are just local modification of this one. So the first one, maybe I should do it like that. The first one is just going to be, I do the same, except that instead of having this, this edge like that, I put this one. OK? I don't modify anything else. OK? And maybe I can do the same, but go the other way. So really, it's important. I do not change anything but this thing. So it's completely local. And in particular, it's, I mean, I can partition the set of walks that arrive and see something in front of them in these three things. Right? I mean, in, in triplets like that. But always the same vertex for this way. Right? Yeah, so the vertex V, it's very important. The vertex V is this vertex, so it's given. It's fixed. Sorry? Yeah, V is this guy. Yeah. V is this one. Yes. Yes. OK. Let's try to prove that the contribution C of eta 1 plus C of eta 2 plus C of eta 3, let's try to prove it's 0. And what I will do is simply I'm going to factorize by C of eta 1. So. I get 1 for the first guy. And for the two others, I can try to express the weight, the contribution, in terms of the contribution of eta 1. OK, so let's look at the expression here. The number of edges doesn't change, right? I took this one, I changed it here. So the number of edges is the same. Very good. The number of loops, well, it does change. Here I have one more loop than here. So I'm going to get a 1 over n. Then the e of omega, uh, e of eta, sorry, 
minus v. It does change as well if this is 1, whatever this is, if it's p minus v. This one is j squared, right? Yeah, j squared times uh, p minus v, and this one is j times p minus v. So here I get j squared e to the 4i pi over 3, and here e to the minus, uh, yeah, 2i pi over 3. Remains the winding term, but notice that here the winding term is a certain thing. And here, if I want to compute the winding term at the end, well, it's the winding term up to that, and then I'm going to do something like that. But whatever the path, because I started on the boundary A here, so there is really a domain like that, whatever the path you are picking, you will always do four turns on the left more than turns on the right. Just think of it for one face, if this is just one face, this is true, and it's also stable by adding faces. Therefore, it's true for any pass. So here, I will always get e to the minus i 4 pi over 3. So I will do four turns of pi over 3. There is a minus because it was minus sigma times the winding. I have my sigma. And here, 4 i pi over 3 times sigma. OK? Well, there are exactly two values of sigma here that make this thing 0. And these values are the two values that I put here. So if the bottom line here is that if I pick sigma, or let's call it sigma tilde, the other one, then automatically, whatever the triplets of this type, I get 0. But not every triplet, not every walk is of this type. There are also walks. There are also triplets where you arrive and you don't see anything in front of you. That is possible. Well, in this case, what you can associate it with is just a walk that is extended by 1. And go left, and, uh, and extended by 1, so this is eta 2, and eta 3 is extended by 1, and go right. You do the same computation, see of Sorry? Yes, V is fixed. It's this guy there. So now n is not changing, but x is changing. There is an additional x factor for each one. There is still the e to the 4i pi over 3 and e to the 2i pi over 3. These guys do not change. But now the winding here is just one more turn on the left and here one more turn on the right. So I get e to the minus i pi over 3 sigma, e to the i pi over 3 sigma. Remember now, sigma is fixed now. It was set by the other guys, these triplets. But x is not fixed yet. So if I tune x to cancel this thing, I end up with the right thing. And this is exactly the x and x tilde. So if pick x or x tilde, depending on the thing, then you end up with 0. And now, what, you just, what remains to be proved is simply that all walks ending in P, Q, or R is in one of these triplets. But this, I let you think about it. It's really the only choices that you could end up with. Right, that's the end of the proof. If you sum the contribution and sum by triplets, you get 0. OK? So it gives you a relation. It's an underdetermined system, but it has a very strong interpretation. Can we get anything with it? OK, so 
that's that in the last 40 minutes, I mean 35 minutes, 40 minutes, I started like a little bit late. Sorry? For each sigma, there is only one x, and for each n between uh, 0 and 2, there is only one sigma. Uh, two sigma, sorry. Anyway, I'm allowed to be late because right in. Uh, it, it's some, something of source rail uh, thing, like <laughs> if the uh, if the RER is late, we are allowed to be late, something like that, since it's always late. Okay, uh, what did I want to say now? Yes, so applications of that. Let's try to do things with it. So as I said, looks very bad because we have not enough information in some sense. Well, let me stop you right here. There is one case where we have sufficient amount of information, and that is a case that I'm not going to study, ironically, because Dima will discuss it more. These are a certain number of complex relations on f, right? But when sigma is equal to one half, then in fact, remember, the winding is defined up to two pi. Therefore, one half of this winding is defined up to pi. So e to, uh, e to the i times this one half winding is actually in a certain real line. I mean, it's on a real line passing by the origin. So you know the complex argument modulo pi of your observable in this special case. So when sigma equals one half, you know that f of z belongs to a certain vector, let's call it lambda, lambda z depends on the orientation of the edge on which z is, times r. So in some sense you recover a lot of information because you have much fewer complex variables, but uh, complex equations, but you have only in some sense real variables. So there you recover sufficient information and there is a whole world of beautifulness uncovering in front of you. And that's what uh, um, Dima will discuss this afternoon. So special case of easing at criticality, sigma equal one half is easing at criticality. You have a lot of additional information, okay? The game of this morning is I'm not going to discuss that. I'm going to discuss the, uh, the case where you don't have a lot of information at the cost, unfortunately, of saying much less, right? You cannot hope uh, to do better than Dima with fewer information. That's not possible. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you put pressure on somebody. Uh, okay, so, yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> but I have two hours to do it, so I will do it until the end. Uh, anyway, so in this case, it's special, but let's ignore this case. Let's really work when we don't have a lot of information. So. Here, we were stuck with, with uh, Stas Smirnov. So, I mean, Stas Smirnov is going to uh, pop up in several, uh, it should already have popped up in several discussions, by the way, but I'm not really uh, giving uh, credit yet. I was thinking about doing it in theorems, but maybe not. So this observation here, while it was, and we will see, uh, discovered much bit before uh, in the early 90s, this type of relations, they were rediscovered by Stas Smirnov in the context of trying to take scaling limits, uh, trying to prove conformal invariance of the lattice model, Stas Smirnov. It, wi it was at the same time also rediscovered by Cardi and Al. So a bunch of, uh, of models were, uh, were studied by, uh, by a physicist where well, they found that, in fact, this is not an isolated case. So I will define, I mean, I will actually tell you more in the conclusion about that. Okay, uh, so here with Stas Mirnov, we were stuck with this lack of information until we discovered uh, that some things that we knew for a long time was actually very useful, is that on the boundary, the winding is deterministic. You cannot wind around a point on the boundary, so the winding, if I take the domain 
a and I take z on the boundary, any walk going from a to z with loops, any walk like that is arriving with the same winding. So this made us think that probably a good idea would be to just test, in some sense, the fact that we have zero contour integral on the boundary. So between two boundary points. Between two boundary points, we have deterministic winding. So it's, it hints that maybe if you take as a contour the boundary of omega, right. then maybe you can get information. Because you have, in this case, a little bit more than just the uh, relation. So what you do is let's just take the discrete contour on the boundary. And let's write that the integral along boundary of omega of f of z dz equals 0. So here, as I said, on the boundary, the observable f of z is in fact proportional to g of z. You remember g was without the winding term. Well, it's proportional. The only thing that differs is that you have e to the i sigma times the winding. So you have e to the minus i sigma winding. And I'm going to put from a to z in omega just to really highlight that this is a function of omega, the ending point and the starting point, but not anymore a function of gamma, and in particular of eta. And here I get g of z. g of z is without the winding term, equals 0. Just here, I have the ci plus 1 minus ci, right? And in fact, the ci plus 1 minus ci, if you think about it, it's just a global complex number times e to the i winding from A to Z. In fact, you can write it like that. So you get that this thing is zero, except there is one small headache, which is actually a very good uh, headache. It's not that common. Is that when you go from A to A, it's not really what you would like to define as the winding would be this quantity. But in fact, you just don't move. So here, a plays a special role where A is just giving you uh, something different. And by the way, I told you what it was giving you. F of A is 1. So let's say if you take the, the path to go that way, you get Ci plus 1. And let's say A is at the bottom like that. Ci plus 1 minus Ci is just minus 1. So it's minus 1 times 1. So if I pass it on the other side, I get 1. Okay, So if I integrate, if you want, on everybody but the starting point, you end up with 1. The good thing about this is that this is g. It's not f anymore. Particular, it's positive. Okay. So there is one particular case where you get a lot from these relations. So let me do that first and then tell you a little bit more about what happened in the other cases. So at least you will not have come for nothing. Theorem Smirnoff and myself is that xc of 0 oh, well, let's say, uh, yeah, uh, the limit when n tends to infinity of the number of self avoiding walk of length n to the power 1 over n is 1 over xc of 0, which is square root of 2 plus square root of 2 if you plug n equals 0 here. So I told you already that. I told you already that n equals 0 was a self avoiding walk model. And what I claim is that the number of walks of length n on the hexagonal lattice 
to the grows like square root of 2 plus square root of 2 to the n, basically. Okay? It's kind of saying the critical point of this model is xc of 0. Okay? So how do you get that from these things? Well, let's look first at a domain of the following type. So you have A, which is here. Etc. So you have an approximation of the box of size n where you remove a triangle like that. Yes, so that's not a good approximation. Right? That's like that. So still not a good one. And these things are obviously horizontal. Um, look at this domain omega and let's try to write this thing equal 1. Okay? So when you do that, Let's look at what are the contributions of walks ending there or there. Well, I can compute the e to the i w of a z. I mean, so this thing, by the way, is e to the i 1 minus sigma times the winding. So what is the winding from there to there? You do three turns on your, uh, four turns, sorry. On your wow, uh, four turns on your right, so the winding is minus pi, uh, four pi over three. And what is sigma? Well, you put there. You think, okay, sigma here. Let's make a small computation. I mean, let me make the small computation. Uh, let I, I guess. Anyway, uh, this sigma is five over eight, so I get three over eight. So when I do the winding count, I end up with zero. I mean, I end up with i. So e to the i 1 minus sigma winding on the right like that is i. On the left is minus i. But if I take the real part, everything disappears, right? Or even without taking the real part, you just get zero because you have a clear symmetry. So any walk ending there is going to cancel the walk ending there. So when I look at this big sum, and I look only at walks ending there or there, they do not contribute to the sum. Now walks that end here, 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 or here, you can also do the same and check very easily that they do not contribute zero. Anyway, they have a complex number of modulus one in front of them. So if I just take the absolute value, I will get that the sum of the g of z for any z which is on these edges of my domain, this is larger or equal to 1. For every n, huh, if I t uh, for every k, if this is the size of my box, for every k, I end up with that. Now, n equals 0 is not a very difficult model to evaluate the empty set of xn, right? The empty set of omega xn, uh, x0, is just 1. You cannot have loops, so you need to have the empty configuration. So this thing here is simply the sum of uh, every walk starting from 0, I mean from a, ending at distance k of xc to the number of edges. So this whole thing here is sum of every walk gamma starting here and ending there of xc to the length of the walk. And this has to be larger or equal to 1. This is true for every k, just sum on every edges, or on every k. What you end up with is that the sum of these things becomes infinite, but that means that the sum, let's go there, the sum of every walk from A to any point in the bulk of Xc to the gamma 
where this has to be infinite because this is definitely larger or equal to the sum of these guys over k. So the sum of these guys is necessarily plus infinity. Well, what does it mean? It means that the number of safe avoiding walk of length n to the power 1 over n, which by the way I didn't tell you, but this quantity does converge. Simply because this number here, cn, if you look at cn plus k, it's smaller or equal to cn times ck. So it's a sub-multiplicative sequence to the power 1 over n, it converges. So this thing converges, and it needs to converge to a quantity mu c, which has to be larger or equal than 1 over xc for this thing to be infinite. So I get one inequality almost for free, basically, right? Well, the other inequality is not really harder to get. So we are just going to pick another domain. And this other domain is, for instance, the strip. Let's forget about the tiny difficulty of the fact that it's an infinite thing. But this is really, really uh, very easy to handle. So when I write exactly the same relation there for this strip, what are the contributions at the top? The ci plus 1 minus ci is 1. The winding is 0. So I get that the contribution at the top is sum over z from a to the top of xc to the length of gamma. What are the contributions of the guys at the bottom? Now the winding is pi or minus pi. And if you check, I mean, if you were getting 0 when you do that, you should not be very surprised that you get something larger or equal to 0 when you do that or that. So in fact, here, the contribution of the guy at the bottom, they just contribute positively to your sum. And you end up with 1. OK? Well, that tells you that this is smaller or equal to 1. Now, if you define the number of self avoiding bridges of length n, and you put it to the power 1 over n, these seconds, so bridges are walks that never pass below their starting point and never go above their ending point. So they are exactly walks of this type for a certain height. The, the bridges, they are super multiplicative. If you know, look at the number of bridges of length n plus k, you can always concatenate a bridge of length n and a bridge of length k to end up with a bridge of length n plus k. So if you do that, you, uh, you understand that this thing is going to converge to something. But the fact that the number of bridges of length n have a height which is smaller or equal to n, they contribute to these guys for height smaller or equal to n, so the number of bridges of length n cannot grow faster than, x, than 1 over xc to the n, because otherwise this thing would have to blow up much faster than 1. So this thing has to converge to something, let's call it mu tilde c, which has to be smaller or equal to 1 over xc. So the, the end of the proof of this theorem where is it? OK, well, yeah, it disappeared. The end of the proof of the theorem is to prove that this quantity is equal to this one. So you need to prove that you, you have obviously fewer bridges than walks. So the question is to prove that you don't have exponentially fewer bridges than walks. But this is something classical, and I let you think about it. It's actually a nice exercise. OK? So that was the first application, and I definitely erase always the wrong place, but that's OK. Um, what is it? No, no. What is behind? Yeah, what is behind is not the right thing either, but uh, maybe I should have erased that. So anyway, the point is that just using the discrete contour integrals on the boundaries, you can still identify the critical point of 
the safe avoiding works like the n equals zero case. You can in fact do that in a much larger uh, generality. For n larger or equal to one, you can indeed prove that xc of n, so at xc of n, you have um, uh, you have you are in the critical phase. So you don't have exponential decay of correlations. And the idea is to use the lower bound here. The same idea as this. You will prove that the g of z for z far from the boundary don't decay too fast. That kind of tells you that at least if you think all the loops are logarithmically small, then having long path should be exponentially costly as well. So the g of z should decay exponentially fast in the distance. It's not completely easy to relate this exponential decay or non-exponential decay to the exponential decay of loops, but for n larger or equal to 1, you can do it by FKG type uh, properties of the model. That is just a parenthesis. I want to end up with something else, so I don't, uh, don't discuss that. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yes. But it's the same as this one. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, another application now. I, I, I give it because I really think it's a very cute and maybe the simplest application, in fact, of this is take n equal 1 and work in a strip like that. So exactly by the same computation as before here, you end up with some of z on the top of g of z plus contribution of guys on the, on the bottom. But notice that for n equal 1, sigma is equal to 1 half. If sigma is equal to 1 half, because the winding here is pi or minus pi, the contribution is going to be i or minus i. So in fact, in this case, the contribution of the bottom is 0. So you get that the sum of the g of z on the top is equal to 1. But the g of z, for those who know the easing model, the g of z here by the high temperature expansion, it's exactly the spin-spin correlation of your system. So this is saying that in a strip like that, the spin, the sum of the spin-spin correlation between top and this point is equal to 1. So what does it say on each one of those? It basically says that they decay like 1 over distance. Right? You have of order, like if this is the height t, This point and this guys have a certain spin-spin correlation. Let's say all points that are basically within distance t have the same spin-spin correlation. And the further you go, the, I mean, it actually starts decaying fast. So here, you can basically identify the one-arm exponent on the boundary for the easing model. You can prove that correlation sigma 0, sigma x on the boundary is equal to 1 over distance, basically, for easing at criticality. So it's, and actually, it's kind of, you can push this further to try to guess, in fact, what are the boundary exponents for all the ON models. You have games like that where you can try to guess these things. Let me finish in the 10 to 15 last minutes by telling you that there is hope, in some sense. There is definitely hope when you have all the information. So when sigma is equal to 1 half, this you will see that it's more than hope. It's actually mathematical theorems. But let me tell you about another result due to Stas Smirnov, and which maybe at first doesn't, I mean, at least didn't look like it was fitting in the realm of parafermionic observables. So this, uh, this result dates back to 2001, and it's saying that you can prove Cardi's formula. So what does it mean? You take 
critical percolation on triangular lattice T, so it's percolation of parameter one half on the triangular lattice, and you want, you take a domain omega, you take an hexagonal lattice of mesh size delta in omega, four points on the boundary, A, B, C, and D, and you want to know, so remember we color the faces in pluses or minuses, right, or in black and white. So you want to know whether you have a pass of black going from this arc to this arc. Okay? So probability, let's call it P delta just to mean that the mesh size is delta of this thing. And you want to know what it does when delta tends to zero. And the beautiful proof of uh, STAS implies that this thing tends, when delta tends to zero, to the following thing. So, I mean, Cardi predicted a very complex formula. I mean, for uh, probabilists, it's a little bit, I mean, uh, there are hypergeometric functions everywhere. They are very natural to pop up there, but here you have another way, uh, a cute way of uh, expressing it, which is that it converges to the following quantity. There is a conformal map between this domain and the triangular lattice. Actually, let's take this one. So, uh, and the triangle, uh, the equilateral triangle, sorry. So you take zero. This is of uh, this one. And um, so this is one e to the i, two pi over three, e to the minus i, um, or e to the four pi over three. And what he claims is that this quantity converges. So let's say this is phi of A. So there is one conformal map from this to this, to this thing, which maps small a to big A, small b to big B, small c to big C. So by the, con or the Riemann mapping theorem, you have a unique map mapping this a, b, c, and this omega to this. So that means that d here is mapped to a certain point, which you don't control where it is mapped. So d is mapped to a certain point here. Let's call it phi of d. Well, it claims that this quantity, when delta tends to 0, converges to this divided by so let's this divided by this. So it converges to, I should write it like that, to uh, AD divided by AC. OK? That's the theorem. And actually, from this theorem, you can prove conformal invariance. So it's actually a very strong theorem, extremely strong theorem. OK. Um, notice if, I mean, yeah, okay, notice nothing, maybe, because I don't have time, but. <laughs> so let me tell you a little bit about the proof. So the original proof didn't really use what I'm going to say, but in fact it was hidden in the, in the way he proved it. If you rephrase in the cast of, if you cast it in the framework of uh, paraphernalic observable, you end up with uh, a very nice proof, yes? Uh, sorry, CD, uh, yeah, sorry, sorry? CD ah, in what I did, it's CD? Yes, sorry, it is definitely CD. Yes. So the original proof didn't use paraphernalic observable, but in fact it did use this. It's something actually that bothered me for years because every single proof of conformal invariance is using, in fact, paraphernalic observables, except up to three months ago, this one. But then we understood it actually is exactly the paraphernalic observable uh, framework. So, okay, so this we said it's n equal 1, but it's the second case. It's sigma tilde, which is 0. So let's look, for instance, at, so f of z is g of z in this case. It's the same, because there is no 
complex weight. So in this case, in this case, you are looking at one pass, I mean, you are summing on pass ending at a vertex like that, mid edge. You are summing these things. X is equal to zero. Uh, X is equal to one. N is equal to one. So you are just counting, right? You are counting the number of configurations like that, and divided by the number of sourceless configurations. How many guys do you have like that, by the way? The number of loop configuration is equal to the number of colorings of the vertices. So this is just 2 to the number of vertices in my graph. Right? Here, how many guys do you have like that? Well, if you think about it, you have 2 to the number of vertices of omega as well. Why? Simply for any configuration here, XOR it with one pass from A to Z that you choose to start with. So you XOR meaning that if the vertex, if the edge was not here and it is on the pass, you add it. If it was here and it is on the pass, you remove it. If you do that, you never kill the sources except at A and Z where you add sources. So there are as many guys like that as guys like that. So you have two to the number of vertices guys like that. So your paraphernalic observable in this case is just one. Not very interesting, right? Yet, there is plenty of generalizations of the paraphernalic observable. And one which is fairly natural, and that's probably the most natural one, is to just say, OK, I put three mark points on the boundary. A, B, and C. I, point one, I put one point Z inside. I look at loop configurations. With one pass from A to Z, but also one pass from B to C. I can look at that if I want. So it's a three mark point paraphernalic observable instead of one mark point. OK? If you do like that, and you try to prove that, so let's call this guy FA. If you try to prove the lemma, things are going to work pretty well, right? You are going to just be able to group any guy like that where this Z is ending in a free spot, if you want, that this vertex is not visited by loops. This you can still extend like that and extend like that. right? So you will get that the contribution of these guys are 0. You can also do the same with this thing and group it like that. It will give you 0. So it looks very good. Ah, yeah, but now there is a new case, which is maybe you arrive, you are coming from A, to the, exactly the loop from B to C. And this one, well, you are not allowed if I change this guy. So what do you want to do here? You would like to change this to say this or this. But in this case, you change the point where you come from. So FA itself is not discrete holomorphic. But if you think about it, F, which is defined as FA plus E to the 2i pi over 3 FB plus E to the 4i pi over 3 FC, each one of those have cancellation in these two cases. But these one all together have cancellation in this one. So f here is discrete holomorphic. Let's assume for a moment that it converges. 
right? Let's assume that you can take the scaling limit and that it converges. So what do you end up with when you do the limit of that? So let's call it f delta. And let's take small f, which is equal to f a plus j f b plus j squared f c. Let's assume that this is uh, well defined the scaling limit of these guys. Uh, any subset control limit of, sorry, this family of functions. Well, first thing that you can observe, f a plus f b plus f c is just all, is counting all the configuration that have sources at a, b, c, and z. You don't need to know how they are wired to each other or anything. I mean, how they, if this point is wired to a, b, or c. You just ignore that, you count all the possibilities. Well, exactly by the same reasoning as there, if you saw with any pair of paths having as sources A, B, C, and Z, you end up with a sourceless thing. So the number of such configuration is two to the number of, of vertices in my graph. So F A delta plus F B delta plus F C delta is equal to one, okay? So F A plus F B plus F C is equal to one. That just means that f is mapping my domain omega in, well, in the triangle with vertices, uh, with vertices 1, j, and j squared. Excellent. That's exactly the image I want to end up with. Now it's fairly easy to also convince yourself that, for instance, f a is 0 on the arc b c. There is no loop configuration with a source from A to a point here, uh, a path from A to a point here, and a path from B to C. They will necessarily intersect. So F A is zero on the arc B C. That means that the arc B C is mapped to B C here. It's a linear combination of J and J squared. Okay? Same thing for A, B, and C, D, and, and uh, C, B. So, uh, BC, sorry. So you are really mapping the boundary edges to the right things. Okay, last but not least, what is the interpretation of F of Z on the boundary? Let's take Z on the boundary BC. And I'm almost done. I'm really two minutes. What is the interpretation of FA there? So it's uh, FA, no, sorry. F A uh, there. Well, it's you have one pass from there to there, and one pass from there to there. What are these configurations? Well, these configurations exactly correspond in percolation. Think of coloring these these hexagons on the exterior in black, those in white, those in black, those in white. Then this is exactly in one-to-one -one correspondence with path, with configuration, with one path from there to there, one black path from there to there. So F A in this case is exactly the probability that you have a crossing from there to there. Fc is 1 minus this crossing. So it tells you that f of z, for instance, on the arc ac, is just probability of the crossing thing. fb is 0, right? This is, we are, uh, z is on the arc ac, so fb is 0. And fc is 1 minus probability of this thing. So that means that if I can tell you what f is, I can tell you what the probability here is. What remains to be proved, so I told you f convert, I mean f is mapped, is a conformal map. Huh? Now, I mean, I took a subsequential limit, so this is a continuous function satisfying Morera theorem. So it's holomorphic. It's mapping omega to the triangle. 
it's mapping the boundary of omega to the boundary of the triangle. And this type of relation also tells you that the more I advance on the boundary, the more here I go from there to there. I go monotonically from there to there, there to there, and there to there. Well, there is a theorem of complex analysis telling you if you have a conformal map from this domain to this domain, mapping the boundary to the boundary in a continuous way, and such that in some way you turn only once around the boundary, well, this is a conformal map between the two domains. So this function f has to be the conformal map from omega to the triangle, and therefore this has to be exactly cd over ca. What is the only thing I didn't prove to you right now? I didn't tell you that you are allowed to take subsequential limits. But in this case, what we call the rousseau semo wedge theory allows you to do it in a very easy way. So there is, why did I want to tell you that? First, because it's an absolutely marvelous theorem. And I think that the proof cast in this framework, which we owed to um, Misha uh, uh, Christophorov, um, this proof is really uh, somehow an illustration that there is hope in the sense that we didn't have enough information, but we managed to prove, uh, I mean, pre-compactness. And somehow it allows you still to say that in, indeed, as uh, Nicolas suggested, that any solution, if you want, of these equations is the right solution. There is only one possibility, therefore you converge and you extract information from it, which is basically the full conformal invariance. From, from this card, this formula, you can really get the full conformal invariance. So the game now is, can one do it for other models? And there, it's much more difficult. In particular, you can guess that sigma tilde equals zero is actually a fairly nice simplification. That not having the winding term messing with your, uh, with your life is a much better uh, uh, thing. But if you assume that you have, uh, you, have pre-compactness, in fact, in general, you can identify what is the limit here. And you can really guess what is the possible behavior of the limit. So at least at a predictive level, you don't really see the difference between sigma tilde equals zero and other sigmas, and you can really understand well uh, what happens to the critical beha behavior of the model. And that's basically there you, you, join, you join the history with the physicists who were basically doing that, in fact. Not quite with the parafermionic observable for some of them, with other mappings and other things, but still they were exactly following this path using, in some sense, uh, discrete homomorphicity. I mean, not following, they were doing it before. I uh, should, uh, should be uh, clear on this. Well, thank you very much. Are there questions? Yeah. yeah. Remarks? So in the case of self overloading model, you have an extra property, which is a restriction property. Does it help? Yes, yeah. yeah, so we, I, I tried exactly this, so to, to extract information from the restriction property, which is saying that if you condition your work in staying in a subdomain, it is really the work in the subdomain. The, I tried, I mean, at the discrete level, I didn't extract any information from it, which is, uh, uh, which is useful. And in particular, you see, even in the continuum, in order to really say it's SLE 8 third, you need to know conformal invariance already. So the, any conform the only conformally invariant process which has a restriction property is uh, let's do the right one. Yeah. If you said n equals 2, yeah. What can you conclude from these considerations? Yes, yeah, so I mean, n equal 2 is a limiting case, but it's also a very interesting case because it's related to another very classical model of, uh, of statistical mechanics, which is XY model. So, XY model. So, there, there is one thing which is special, which is that sigma and sigma tilde, I mean, x and x tilde are the same. Right? They are both equal to 1 over square root 2. So we can prove that this is a critical point in the sense that we are exactly, we, we have, so in some sense we can prove that there is a costalist starless phase transition in some sense, that we have exponential decay 
in a small value of x. And at x equal 1 over square root 2, we can prove that there is no exponential decay. We can also prove it at x equal 1, but that's uh, but we don't know how to really prove that there is a whole uh, regime. We don't have monotonicity properties. They don't work well. So you, we cannot prove, for instance, that for x larger or equal to 1 over square root 2, we have uh, we are in the critical phase. And we don't know conformal invariance. We cannot prove conformal invariance. So that's very comforting. It means that the old work of Spence and myself is exactly. not completely superior. Well, anyway, it will not be because I do think that the model, I mean, here it's still an approximation of the XY model. So uh, that will not shed uh, much light on the XY model itself, I would say. So no, you, you, you are not going to be uh, taken over soon on this one. Any other questions? I, I have a little one, so uh, it's a very small one. Why, why do you restrict to n smaller than uh, 2? Yeah. Yeah. So then you end up with uh, with uh, complex valued uh, spins, like the sigma becomes complex valued, and it doesn't correspond, in fact, there to a critical f uh, to a critical phase. So in fact, for x larger than two, uh, for n larger than two, mm -hmm. you don't have a phase transition. You always get exponential decay, Smaller. whatever the value of x. It's difficult to prove. It's actually a very big open question for the spin model. For this loop models, what we did manage to prove, which is also completely open for the, the spin models, is that for n large, you have no, you always exponential decay. But this would already, like, if you could prove that for the spin o n model, for n large, you have, but fixed, you have exponential decay, this would be like a major. Uh, breaks through and of course n equal to which is a uh, heisenberg is really the, the big question yes sometimes people wonder on the negative side uh, of n yes so negative side i think for instance n equal minus one you have a connection uh, to uh, to um, uh, Louperet's random walk uh, yes there are connections for n smaller than one one complex number at the time, right? I mean, we already have a complex number on the loop. For me, it's already difficult. Uh, indeed, you could just put n negative, just mean that you have a factor minus one or plus one, depending on the parity of the number of loops. But uh, this we never really uh, uh, wonder. I mean, in some way, usually, at least as probabilities, we start by n larger or equal to 1, or q larger or equal to 1 for the random cluster model, because at least we have the FKG inequality. And uh, so we have positively correlated models. And that's why, for instance, I mentioned to you that for n larger or equal to 1, we manage to do things that we don't manage to do for n smaller or equal to 1. Then, once we will have done that, <laughs> which we still don't manage to do anyway, we will do n smaller or equal to 1. And then, I promise you, we will try n smaller than 0. But, uh, <laughs> It will be, at least I would do it in this order. And then yes. n complex. And <laughs> n complex, yes. And uh, well, d larger or equal to 2, that would be the larger or equal to 3. Don't forget <laughs> quaternions. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so I, I'm not sure whether you said this, but I guess f or z or maybe both, they are parathermionic observables, like yeah. your title. Yes. So yes. what does this word mean? Uh, this we <laughs> I post ah yeah yeah you didn't want it I didn't want it either so that uh, I mean the sigma has an interpretation physically like in conformal field theory it corresponds to a spin of the system and you see for for uh, another way of saying easing is a fermionic uh, field on many aspects and sigma is equal to one half sorry. Perfect. You see, I, I just chose the wrong horse. <laughs> I should have. <laughs> and, and sigma, um, for if you take, for instance, dimers, or I mean, there are certain models which has which are bosonic in nature, and for which you can define this paraphernalic observable, and you get sigma equals zero in their What's case. The yes. Let me let me finish. So sigma equals zero. So these models are bosonic, and you get a spin, which is an integer. So here. You see, you are in a case where your spin is neither an integer or a half integer. 
So it doesn't correspond to a particle in physics. Still, you can think of it as a theoretical particle with paraphernalic spin. So, I mean, they were called paraphernalic, I think, right in the literature. I didn't come up with this uh, denomination, so I will only say, basically, because it's not half integers, you just call it paraphernalic. The particles are called paraphernalic. And here, the interpretation, the analogy with the fact that the special cases of sigma equal one half and sigma integers do correspond to behaviors that correspond to bosons and fermions, that there uh, it's called paraphernalic. I'm sorry, it's not an excellent answer, but it's, it's a tough uh, thing. So, so ah. it's 12 and a quarter, so it's a para hour. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>